be mindful. We are going to be mindful of everyone's time. Just um, uh, as I am going to do a brief introduction, I would love for everyone to kind of agree to the rules of the road. This is for all of our rethinking work series. Please uh, put your questions in the Q and A um, section, and then please, um, you know, whatever exchange you might want to have with the entire community use the chat for it and we will be um, a recording because we know quite a few people reached out to us. They're not going to be able to make um, this presentation, but we will follow up with a recording and uh, this, the slides that um, Thomas is going to make available to us. All right, without any further ado, Anna Tavis here, we are continuing with our Rethinking Work series. And today I am delighted to welcome international celebrity in a way, other celebrities in our field, but definitely thought leader and innovator and author, and also um, um, a chief innovation officer, Tomas Chimuro Primuzic also has a day job in addition to being a prolific writer, thinker, and influencer in our field. Just a couple of um, uh, facts about who Tomas is, for those of you who are not familiar um, with his work and his name. Um, uh, Dr. Tomas Chimuro Primuzic is an international authority in people analytics, talent management, leadership development, and everything that has to do with the intersections of people and technology. And really briefly, I think that um, there are lots of people in people analytics and talent management and leadership development, but we go to Tomas to actually get some answers or at least direction in um, navigating the most challenging problems of today when it comes to, again, that intersection of people and technology. And the timing could not be better because as you know, the um, release of uh, chat GPT-4 uh, just happened and the acceleration of technology and introduction of technology into the workplace is continuing. So um, Tomas published 10 books. I'm sure he will speak a little bit about his work um, in the field um, and over 200 scientific papers. He's one of the most prolific social scientists of his generation. He's also a very generous uh, professor and teacher. He's been to NYU multiple times as a guest lecturer and uh, uh, visiting, uh, a visiting scholar. And we hope to see him back again um, um, after his book tour is, um, is completed and he's on to the next one. So Tomas, without further ado, I want to pass the mic to you and take it away. Thank you, Anna. And I think I need to, okay, share my slides, which are here. Uh, let me know if you can see them. Yes, we can see them. Just... Yes. Okay. Thank you, Anna. It's so great to see you. And thank you, everybody, for being here and taking time of your very busy schedule. I hope this is a worthwhile session for you. And uh, what I'd like to do is spend 35 minutes or so discussing the highlights of my latest book, I Human AI Automation and the Quest to Reclaim What Makes Us Unique, and then uh, give, uh, you know, um, give uh, something like the rest of time, 20 minutes or so, or whatever is left for a Q&A discussion, which Anna will come back to moderate. And, uh, you know, the story with this book starts actually at the height of the pandemic, uh, much like I'm sure most of you here, if not all of you, even though I was lucky to be able to continue to do my work and remain relatively productive working from home and remotely, um, I experienced not just increased screen time and smartphone use time, but 
um, the sense that I was at the mercy of all these sticky algorithms that were not just standardizing and sanitizing much of my everyday experiences, but also began to question my own humanity. Uh, so let me start on this existential note. Uh, there's actually a really good book on this called The Most Human Human by Brian Christen. It's a few years old, but in essence, it's a recap of his adventures in trying to pass the equivalent of a reverse Turing test. So in the normal Turing test, a chatbot needs to convince a group of humans that it can produce human-like behavior. And in those tests or experiments, you always have a confederate or a control who is a human um, you know, who is disguised among the chatbots. And Brian Christian trains himself uh, to pass this test and be unanimously designated or identified as a human by 100% of the judges. This is a book worth reading. There's a very simple, much simpler test of humanity that you can do in which I confess I failed at multiple times in the last three or four years. The typical cybersecurity test shown on the left of the screen here, where you have to identify all the traffic lights or trees or wheels in an image. So after failing this numerous times, I began to question my humanity. And have you been automated yet was the original kind of question that I tried to answer with the book. But the book is a book that talks about humans, not computers. It's a book on the AI age, but primarily deals with the impact that AI has had and is having on humanity, on human behavior, on a way of thinking, feeling, working, feeling, and living. And, you know, with that, it's not a book on chat GPT. It was written before the explosion of chat GPT kind of uh, arose. Uh, it is mentioned and other tools are mentioned, but it's more about the impact of AI on humans and what it means to be human in an age where most of our decisions and most of our behaviors are influenced by algorithms. So it's not a book about ChatGPT, just like my previous book, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and How to Fix It, was not really about Trump or Boris Johnson or Putin or Elon Musk, even though as Saint Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince said, the essential is often invisible to the eyes. So sometimes you don't need to mention what the book is about and it could still be about that. Let me start with a very simple question, which is, what do I mean by AI? AI is not cybernetic, cyborg, synthetic issues, artificial general intelligence, or singularity, uh, the idea that you know we're either merging with machines and becoming as one, or reach a point where computers or machines uh, make us irrelevant and surpass our intelligence. What AI mostly is, at least in the field that we operate in and in the ways that you and I are affected by it, is basically a prediction machine. It's software designed to identify hidden patterns in large data sets with an ability to relentlessly improve and get better even with minimal supervisions. And mostly when we think about AI, what we mean is algorithms. Algorithms are like a recipe. And in the form that they impact human behavior, it's typically in the form of recommendation engines or algorithms that are designed to simplify our decision-making, but also make us more predictable. And so if you have a background in analytics or data science, you can also understand AI from a data scientific perspective as really um, you know, data analysis or correlations on steroids. And at the same time, not everything that is claimed to be AI is AI. Although we have seen in recent times an interesting progression or transition up until three or four years ago, everybody was pretending to do AI because it sounded cool and may, you know, ramp up their valuation if there were startup co-founders or venture capitalists. And today, everybody's so scared of regulations around AI ethics, et cetera, that everybody's claiming very, very strongly not to be doing AI even when they are. The AI age, which is the age we are living in, has three enablers. So there are three preconditions that actually 
created or enabled the AI age. The first is hyperconnectedness, the fact that we are now more connected to other people, things, information, and stuff than we ever were. The second one is that as a consequence of that hyperconnectedness, we are emitting or producing a lot of data. The datafied you is basically a bigger portion of your life today than the undatified you. Not so long ago, we would talk about the quantified self as a kind of niche movement. And today, the unquantified self is almost nothing. It has been downgraded or reduced to fragments of your behavior or existence. And with that datification comes the business model that justifies basically the existence and huge valuation of big tech firms and of any platform that actually harbors AI, which is the lucrative business of predicting behavior. Let me expand a little bit on these three. So hyperconnectedness, you know, those of you who are um, as old as me or older will have nostalgic memories of the noise that dial-up connection would make in the early days of the internet and how adrenalizing it was to wait 20 or 30 seconds to get online and uh, visit uh, an obscure chat room in which nobody knew that you were a dog. Um, fast forward a couple of years or so, and we would go and spend time uh, with unlimited browsing and internet cafes, and it was exciting to actually disconnect from the real world for two or three hours. Fast forward a little bit, and it's very hard to put our phone down and to disconnect. Most of you will be multitasking now, looking at a different screen or distracted, even though you're listening to me at this stage. So the idea of an internet of things or you of things is not so distant as it was even two or three years ago. Most of us are emitting a lot of data through multiple devices. And there's really just one small step between this and having AI implanted in our brains, whether through Neuralink or a different company. So as Yuval Harari stated in Homo Deus, we are becoming tiny chips inside a giant data processing system that nobody really understands. This book was written eight or nine years ago what he predicted and what that element of becoming is here and is our current reality today. On to the identification of us or of you. So all of these data that we produce can be translated into a pretty reliable and robust model of who we are and how we differ from others. In fact, when Anna comes back for the Q&A, uh, she will confirm that about nine or 10 years ago when we had an in-person meeting and we're talking about the early kind of stages of this, it was still quite novel and unusual. This was right at the time of the Snowden NSA saga when right after Target basically had reported or the news stories on Target reported that the store analyzing their big data could tell that one of their customers was pregnant before she decided to share the news with her family and posted pregnancy products to her, which created, you know, a black mirror-esque or creepy sensation that has become the norm today. This is really the new normal. And while the version of you or the model of you that Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitter, Amazon, Netflix, Spotify, et cetera, have of you might be impartial, if we could stitch all of these models together, we would arrive to a very accurate representation of who you are that can predict what you do better than your best friends and your family or relatives. And finally, the prediction machines or the lucrative business of prediction machines. I mean, just look at the, the comparison on the left. If the five big tech firms or biggest tech firms were a country, they would rank number three on global GDP with a GDP of 8 trillion. Apple alone has a market cap that is bigger than the GDP of Italy, Brazil, Canada, and many other big countries. And as you will have seen a few weeks ago when Google or Alphabet tried to unsuccessfully launch a rival product to JetGPT, it lost $100 billion in market cap or valuation. So this is the value that we're attributing to AI, the promise that it can actually predict and also, of course, influence human behavior. But I don't want to talk about so much about the AI and what it does and how these engines function, but more what we do when we are at mercy or influenced by these tools and artificial intelligence engines. 
And what we have seen so far, which is the focus of the first half of the book, is that artificial intelligence has unleashed and is unleashing some of our least desirable dark side tendencies. It has made us more unfocused, more impulsive, more biased, more narcissistic, more predictable, and less curious. And let me be clear about this. It's not like the bar was very, very high to begin with. It has not created these bad behaviors, but it has amplified or augmented them. And I want to focus on three or four as an example. So you see what I mean. First, I'm focused. I think AI is mostly a massive weapon of mass destruction. It co-ops or hijacks our attention and all of the platforms that uh, inhabit AI or that AI inhabits are designed to be sticky and are fueled by algorithms that make us return and basically co-opt our attention, focus, and concentration. So in the UK and the US, the average person today will be expected to spend about six hours a day on their smartphone, which equates to 21 years of life. And that's only going up. The trend is still kind of uh, rising or increasing. Um, there has been much discussion in the past 10, 15, or 20 years as to why technology has not increased productivity. And actually, there's a very simple explanation of this. Productivity was increasing up until the mass adoption of social media platforms, at which point, perhaps every minute or hour of our working day that has been saved or economized through productivity tools like technology was reinvested or wasted on social media platforms. Let me give you a few statistics, and there's a lot more information in the book, so I do hope that you consult it, but knowledge workers, which represent about 60% of the US workforce, will waste 25% of the time on digital distractions, 70% of workers in the knowledge economy worldwide report to productivity drops, 75% of phone use is during, but not for, work during work hours, but not for work. And 40% of people reportedly check their phone during the night. So they interrupt their sleep, their precious sleep, to actually check their email, social media feeds, or uh, update their status. This productivity loss has been estimated at $650 billion a year in the US alone. That's 15 times higher than sickness or health leave related productivity losses. And here's an interesting factoid for you, multitasking, which is a myth and doesn't work. Every time you switch task, you lose concentration, you lose focus, and you kind of reset, deducts the equivalent of 10 IQ points, which is apparently equivalent twice as debilitating intellectually as smoking weed, which I'm sure some of you will think is at least more pleasurable. But we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the effects of AI on cognition. B making us more biased is another one. And to be perfectly clear at the outset here, humans have not needed AI or any technology to actually fine tune or finesse the biases. We have been perfectly fine and managed perfectly all right as a species being biased, prejudiced, and stereotyped for millennia throughout generations without the help of any tool, digital or otherwise. But what AI does is it encapsulates us in our digital cocoon or filter bubble or echo chamber. And it makes it very, very difficult for us to actually get access to information that disproves our beliefs. So it's an age in which, um, you know, never in doubt and always wrong seems to be the defining mantra of our times. Even with um, you know uh, known uh, horror stories of AI being co-opted for malicious purposes, such as the Cambridge Analytica fiasco, which obviously caused huge interference in the 2016 election and in the Brexit referendum, it's quite interesting to look at the research model or design underlying this campaign, which was basically to simply decode people's Facebook footprint and translate it into a predictive model of who they would vote for, with the realization that only 15% of people, Facebook users, which are equivalent to a whole population basically, are considered persuadable. So think about that, 85% of people are beyond persuasion. You cannot persuade them with facts, with arguments, even with fake news. 
So the fact that even back then, uh, only a tiny minority of the voting population, the population in general, would be open-minded enough to actually receive or be exposed to arguments that change their mind tells you everything you need to know about our biases. Of course, in an age in which we're forced to make more and more rapid decisions and function along the lines of what behavioral economists have labeled system one, very impulsive and rapid, non-intellectual, non-deliberal decision-making, uh, this gets exacerbated and it's like throwing gasoline to the fire. And we need no reminder because we're still in the pandemic, even though it's hopefully the end of the pandemic, of how tribalized and polarized attitudes were, even when they were detached from facts and reality during this pandemic. And there's a very nice quote here by comedian Patton Oswald that you can read for yourselves. So that is making us basically more unfocused, is making us more biased. It is also making us more narcissistic. Narcissism has been rising for about 100 years. Well-documented rises in America have been published in academic research papers for at least six or seven decades. And uh, again, it's not like social media has created narcissism, but the AI algorithms that fuel it and that make these platforms sticky actually have normalized narcissism and have made digital narcissism the mainstream form of interaction in these platforms. In the analog world, if you go around, let's say your office, if you still visit an office, talking to your colleagues only about yourself, oversharing, engaging in inappropriate self-disclosure and telling them that you got upgraded into the business lounge and what your cat had for breakfast and how amazing you are while ignoring them and not listening to them and engaging in self-promotion all the time, shameless attention seeking and craving a pathetic degree of insecure validation to boost your egos, you'll be labeled quite obnoxious. But in the digital world, this is just normal modus operandi and could make you an influencer and elevate your social status. So if narcissism continues to rise at this rate and you see it even being lubricated by algorithms that we find in TikTok, Instagram and the like, or whatever the next version is, in 50 years, we might look back at some of the most narcissistic figures of today and see them as quite humble compared to what we'll find then. Hopefully the trend will be reversed, but so far there's no indication that this will happen. And AI is also making us more predictable. This is a very interesting kind of jiu-jitsu move or twist, whereby since AI benefits from selling accurate predictions about human behavior, but possibly plateaus in its ability to increase accuracy, it's defaulting to making ourselves more predictable. So think about Gmail completing your emails for you, Netflix reducing the number of movies that you might want to watch, or Amazon reducing the number of products that you might want to browse. Because we are time deprived and we are intellectually lazier and lazier, and they need to increase the predictive accuracy of the arguments, they constrain the range of choices by actually turning their predictions into a self-fulfilling prophecies. So the skeptics among you will say, well, hold on, this is there's nothing new here. Um, we have a long history for blaming our own technological inventions for our cultural demise, and that is true. You can go back to the age of Socrates and his contemporary philosophers who opposed writing because they thought writing stuff down would undermine memory. When newspapers were invented, critics lamented that people would never meet again in public because there would be no reason to meet if there's no nothing to gossip about and you can find out or keep up with the news through the paper. And of course, since the advent of television and radio and other mass media, we've called them the opium of the people and so forth. But I don't think a default underreaction is the best necessary alternative to a default overreaction. In fact, you know, we have examples of things that ended up being very, very harmful and toxic and where we were too slow to react to point out the dangers. Those of you who enjoyed the show Mad Men will remember a famous scene in which Betsy Draper, shown here smoking, is advised by her doctor, by her gynecologist, to smoke even more so she can have an easy pregnancy when she gives birth. 
and of course the rise of fast food or you know the industrial sugar complex it's only in recent years that we began to be aware of the obesity epidemic, which again highlights the ability and the malleability or adaptability that humans have to identify trends that are unpleasant and painful and actually accept or gain a reality check to actually change their behavior. But it requires self-regulation and a lot of willpower and determination. So what should we do if this is the reality? Well, mostly try to harness the qualities that AI won't learn. I do think that AI can teach us not what it means to be human in the AI age, but how we can future prove ourselves and invest in the attributes or qualities that will remember a unique selling point or differentiator for humans. For humans against other humans and for humans against machines. But we need to find out how best to partner, team up or collaborate with AI and other technologies. So these are empathy, the ability to truly care about others and show affection, kindness, and consideration to others. There's a great book by Paul Bloom that I always mention and cite here because as he points out, even empathy alone is not enough. By definition, we are pre-wired to feel empathy for those who are more like us which actually hinders or harms diversity and inclusion. So if we truly want to have diverse and inclusion society, it's not enough to rely on our instincts. We need to actually engage in rational compassion and deliberate kindness towards others. Another one is self-awareness, right? So understanding ourselves better than machines understand us and understand how we are evolving or potentially devolving in the age of AI. I think self-awareness is still uh, an in intrinsically or inherently human feature. Of course, last year we've heard a lot of claims about sentient AI and AI that is self-aware. We can, of course, ask AI such as ChatGPT whether it is self-aware. And what you find is the paradoxical answer, right? Where it says, oh, I'm just a large language model and AI model, so I'm not self-aware, not capable of self-awareness, which actually makes it very self-aware. It's aware of its lack of self-awareness, which is almost the reverse you find with humans. They always say they are self-aware, even when they gave very little signs of self-awareness in everyday life or interactions with others. Curiosity. So I think this is a really, really important. And here, I think the analogy with fast food stands in an age of ubiquitous information. It is very easy to be misinformed or uninformed or ignorant because all of that information is the equivalent of fast food for our hungry mind is not nutritious, it doesn't make us smarter, and actually it's engaging in critical thinking and deep thinking or deep learning, a term that has unfortunately been co-opted by AI. I wish we used deep learning to refer to human learning rather than machine learning or artificial intelligence. Those are the answers and how we can see humans thrive in an age in which access to information and facts will be commoditized and will be democratized. So it's how you use that information, your ability to vet and actually um, evaluate the accuracy of that information and to ask the right questions and derive the right actions from those insights that actually will make you smart. Um, and finally, creativity. I mean, there's already been impressive examples that you might be aware of, of AI being creative, even GPT-4 and before that chat GPT-3 actually excels more at doing things like um, creating jokes or improvising poems or creating computers uh, code more than retrieving facts for which Google and Wikipedia are probably still better. But AI has been already trained or taught to improvise like Miles Davis and being able to fool 90% of jazz critics AI running out of a smartphone, as I discussed in the book, has completed Schubert's eighth symphony, the unfinished symphony, and produced art that has been sold for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars at auctions. And this will only continue. But we still have the ability to inject some creativity into our own lives by becoming less predictable and by actually engaging in behaviors that surpass or exceed the model that AI has on you. If everything algorithms know about you is sufficient to sum up the entire existence of you, then you know you may have been, you may as well be automated or be in the matrix. 
So let me finish with a few slides, two or three slides on implications for the workplace, since that's what concerns many of you, if not most of you. And although I've highlighted a lot of the negative impact that AI has had and is having on humans, I'm still optimistic about the opportunity to use AI to increase meritocracy and fairness at work, but it requires competent and ethical humans that are involved in the design of algorithms and AI, and actually having the humility and self-criticism to question our intuition and actually refute and overcome our biases. Humans are biased by design. No amount of unconscious or conscious bias training will debias humans, but we still have the ability to create tools that could create fairer societies and fairer workplaces. So if you think about recruitment, you know, the average recruitment interview is still very unreliable. The average promotion internally in organization is still way too influenced by nepotism and politics and privilege than by merit. When I talk about KPIs, I mean, the way in which we measure performance at work is still very subjective. If you go into any organization and you ask even the HR professionals, but any employee, whether the people at the top of the career success ladder organizational hierarchy are also the ones that add more value and the most competent and talented employees, mostly people will be perplexed or laugh at you. We have already seen examples of how AI can be used to improve the quality of feedback that people get, even coaches, and how it can enhance aspects or elements of coaching. And I also think that AI can be a great tool to actually improve inclusiveness or inclusivity by detecting or revealing the invisible dynamics that connect individuals in an organization and actually identify people who are marginalized, ostracized, or not part of the status quo. The sources of bias in all of these stories that receive a disproportionate amount of coverage in the media of algorithms gone rogue or breaking bad are always human. It's always because we are training AI with data training data that is contaminated or corrupted or polluted by human bias or intuition. So if we're teaching a self-driving car to coat objects on a street, the humans that coat objects as trees or traffic lights or bicycles don't have opinions about these objects. And if they do because they hate traffic lights or they love trees, it doesn't matter. It doesn't pollute their classification or encoding of these objects. But when we're feeding AI data on high-performing employees or high-potential employees, we're actually perpetuating the dominant standards of success, which can not just replicate, but also augment human biases. So when Amazon or Microsoft try to develop or put in place chatbots to improve their selection and these algorithms ended up recommended a surplus, recommending a surplus of middle-aged white male engineers. The bias is not in the AI, the bias is not in the algorithm, the bias is in that system. If you don't use this AI, middle-aged white, middle, middle white male engineers will still get promoted at an unfairly rate and be overrepresented in the leadership ranks. So unlike humans, Algorithms, AI machines don't have a fragile self-esteem that they need to maintain or bump up by bringing other people down. And so that's really the opportunity. So you could actually make recruitment and performance management gender blind and color blind and age blind and privilege blind and use AI to focus on the signals that truly determine value and success, but it requires a lot of work. It requires designing AI that is ethical and requires putting certain basic par uh, parameters or standards in place, which by the way, are no different from the historical or old school parameters that we've had for psychometric assessments in selection regulated by um, industrial organizations, psychologies, bodies, and et cetera. So transparency, sincerity, and informed consent where people know what they're signing up for or to what happens to their data, reliable and valid, accurate insights turned around from this AI or this data. Uh, explainability, not black box, but white block, block box models, where again, AI has an advantage because the only algorithm that is truly always a black box algorithm is the human mind. 
no matter what somebody tells you, what an interview says, when they justify that they selected this person and not that person, we never know whether it was because they were competent or confident, male, female, young, old, attractive, unattractive. Whereas with AI, you can always look under the hood and understand the reasoning paths and the decision-making paths behind the algorithms giving people feedback and ensuring that there is a benefit for candidates and employees is also a must. And if you do these things, the chances that you end up with something that isn't perfect, but that is better than something that relies only on humans and sometimes even has humans in the loop are significant. And fundamentally, we need to understand that the goal here is not perfection, but an improvement over the status quo. And in most areas of life, the status quo is a low bar, right? So when we are scandalized because a self-driving car crashes, but we are okay with 1.3 million people dying every year, courtesy of human errors, human drivers, that signifies or highlights double standards. Same if we're scandalized for uh, you know, wrong or inappropriate or unsuccessful application of machine learning in selection, recruitment, or any area of human capital, while humans keep on getting away with murder and overindulging in their biases, intuition, and flaws. So with that, Anna, I'm gonna bring the real you back in so that we can have a discussion and a Q&A with everybody. And I hope everybody, you buy the book if you haven't bought it. And if you have bought it or read it, or even if you don't re read it or read it, leave a positive review on Amazon so we can trick their algorithms. We have the human power to do it. Just go and do it. All right. Um, you know, I'm I'm quoting the last comment here. Uh, amazing talk. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, if I could summarize before I dive into um all of the comments here, <clears throat> um, I want to remind us all um of the quote from um Ed Wilson, who is um uh, um social um biologist uh, from Harvard remember we have polyolithic institutions medi no we have poly polyolithic brains, brains medieval yeah. institutions and godlike technology right and i think we keep um, um we keep uh, walking into this misalignment between our brains which you so uh, beautifully described and laid it out to uh, for us and uh, the institutions that we have, the work, the regulatory systems, et cetera, and then the technology that is racing away and uh, how do we actually catch up with it at this point? And uh, here I want to comment, uh, uh, pull out a few comments and questions. Uh, Greg Mendez uh, wrote that in the early days of the internet, we allowed it to expand creatively and only enacted laws and regulations when needed. And because of the implications of AI and recruitment and HR and the impact on humans, should we start developing those regulations and laws for AI now and take a more uh, or take a more wait and see approach? So look, obviously there is an element that of hitting at a moving target. This is still evolving and a lot of regulations are hard to um create when this is still work in progress or in development but actually there is a lot of activity in this area more in europe than in the us but even in the us and not just new york and california but lots of states actually they're passing laws and regulations about ai governing and limiting the uses applications um of AI, especially in human capital, at a very, very fast rate. In fact, in some instances, Anna, I would say that we are at risk of over-regulating certain things just because, you know, I give you an example, right? Anything that is video interview technology is very creepy and freaks people out because they're going to associate it with, you know, a bad government using it for racial profiling or whatever, which is happening right now, but it's a very, very independent and different use. So sometimes the utility could be very good. I mean, even uh, face recognition and video interviewing or um, voice profiling 
is incredibly promising for medical diagnosis and not being done because people are afraid that it's going to be misused, right? So I think sometimes it's not about how fast regulation happens, but it has to happen at an appropriate speed and, you know, focusing on the right, on the, on the right uh, variables and factors, mitigating the risks, but actually enhancing or enabling the opportunity. Yeah, and I think that uh, to connect a few other questions here, that uh, from uh, Roy Altman here, uh, so who should be thinking about regulation? Because as you know, you know, if these questions are brought in to, you know, at least our current governing governing bodies, uh, there is a big gap between the people who are passing legislation in in terms of even awareness and the knowledge that's required to make smart decisions. Um, about regulation. So the question is, who should be regulating AI? Mm -hmm. So obviously governments, and I think we have seen already attempts, but many of us will remember, you know, how uninformed certain Congress people seemed when they were interviewing or uh, deposing Mark Zuckerberg about whether Facebook is you know, addictive and whether it causes uh, ADHD or whatever, and whether it propagates false news, et cetera. They didn't even know what the business model was. And, you know, it was a little bit of a shambolic manifestation, but again, nothing new here. We've had other CEOs and uh, executives in big tech companies increasingly be subject to regulation, like before it was, you know, big pharma, big tobacco, big oil, et cetera, not big banks, no exemption. And I think so they should, right? Because if potentially we are at risk of um, really interacting with technologies that create anxiety, depression, ADHD, and hinder people's development and careers, then how is that different from other toxic substances that exist and that we regulate uh, for or against? No difference whatsoever. Now, at the same time, we need self-regulation, right? Just like with all the other things. I mean, um, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, etc. they're all regulated and they have big work, but you still need to self-regulate to understand how to use them or avoid them as widely as possible. And that requires educating people, educating consumers, but it also requires teaching and cultivating self-control and self-regulatory skills, because these are the very competencies or qualities that are under attack by these algorithms. And I just had from my book, see, I have my own copy here, Anna, mm -hmm. and one quote that goes hand in hand with yours by Pamela Pavlisak, which says, we design tech and tech in turn designs us, which is really, uh, what's at stake here and how we can sort of frame this interaction between humans and technology. Absolutely. I, I think uh, how humans are going to evolve, and that's a big question, because um, we don't want to be sounding like we just want to preserve who we were, because that is not a possible goal to set. Clearly, the evolution will continue in parallel and tracking how humans evolve is important so that we move in the right direction. Um, and the questions, there are a few, quite a few questions here, anonymous. Uh, where do we find those more ethical humans to create these tools you speak of? Because, oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, who designs, decides whether they're ethical. Look, it, it will be a great question. It will be a starting point if, we ensure that they are competent, right? Because a lot of the errors are not even that, you know, for example, when we enable, when we train AI with contaminated work data that ends up corrupting or exacerbating biases in personnel selection or recruitment, let's say that, you know, the outcome is that uh, even more men are unfairly selected into leadership roles than women. That usually isn't because of uh, a kind of a secret plot or a group of uh, bro programmers, hoodie wearing programmers in Silicon Valley who have as their agenda to bring down females in the world. No, it's because they are not trained in IO psychology or performance management, or they don't have the knowledge to understand things like the unreliability of performance ratings, right? So sometimes competence 
would be enough. And then, well, you know, we know how to assess for ethics and for integrity. And um, despite the fact that there is a fair amount of subjectivity in what one moral code considers as appropriate versus inappropriate, at the end of the day, there is such a thing as humans who are more benevolent in their intent and some who are more malevolent. So I think when we say that technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral, it's what we do with it. I think, you know, um, there is usually consensus when we judge the applications or implications of technology AI is no exception to different areas of life. Yeah, that uh, leads us to a next to the next very very um, appropriate question here from Mudala. Uh, what role can we as HR professionals play to bring this awareness on the impact of AI? Really, really good question. I think the number one challenge for organizations in the next few years, starting now, is to rehumanize work to ensure that people's experience at work and off work isn't as sanitized and sterilized as it is or as you would expect when they're just interacting with machines and where even their human to human interactions are mediated or intermediated by machines i think we are at risk of losing a lot of the things that made work a pivotal and critical interesting and rewarding part of human experience and so just like if you're an hr professional today you need to understand data and you need to understand diversity and inclusion and you need to understand you know what it means to uh, you know uh, represent the voice of your employees and be employee centric and while also being morally or politically committed or neutral without virtue signaling and all these complex ethical conundrums that weren't there even 20 years ago, you actually need to understand how to manage the human AI interface and how to ensure that as a result of that, humans are augmented and not diminished, right? So it seems to me that so far at least, rather than raising the psychological standards of humanity, it has turned it into a very, very dull and monotonous and predictable species. So how can we reverse some of that and create the conditions, the working environments for people to thrive and actually rediscover their humanity and rediscover what it means to live and work in a humane way? Yeah, yeah, definitely a big agenda. A specific question, we'll take a couple more, um, Tomas here. Overall, do you agree with Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, that AI will help amplify human potential? I think it has the potential to do that, right? But it still requires um, us to get our act together. It requires understanding. We need to work it out. I think we'll probably get there. Um, the question is whether it is an equalizer or it even exacerbates existing inequalities, right? Before, with other tools, we have seen it can go both ways. Now, the early adopters, the people who are jumping on it and working out how to use it are probably the ones that were more advan advantage or privileged to begin with. We need to ensure that actually this is a tool that benefits those who are uh, less privileged, those who have access to fewer educational resources and possibilities, and actually that we protect those who are more vulnerable to automation and to being outperformed by others and being deemed, uh, you know, less relevant because someone else is using these tools. So I think it's not that easy. You can't just leave people to their own devices and say, okay, here it is, work it out, be more productive. You have to actually teach, train, and educate. And fundamentally, gains in productivity should be reinvested in more rewarding and intellectually enriching activities. All right. Okay. That's very... Um... Uh, very extensive. And the last one, I think, fits in with what we are discussing now around training. So the question here is, um, 
when you're saying they're not trained, it sounds like you are calling these computer scientists, computer computer science degrees, uh, and and masters and researchers not particularly smart or <laughs> intelligent. How does that square? with the complexity of the technologies they are creating. Is this a matter of smartness or of training? I so think it's it a matter of, yeah, I think, well, you know, I wasn't calling them dumb or anything like that. I just think that their training is and was narrow because it's understanding how to code and they're fundamentally engineers and they understand technology. The amount of training or education you need to have to understand, you know, um, organizational psychology, the philosophical aspects of bias, the economical implications, the political, etc. It's like you have to have a very broad formation. And I think um, Harari actually argued a few years ago that it is not unthinkable for organizations to have AI ethicists uh, in-house, in residence, which is starting to happen, or that the average or at least good computer scientists or person getting a computer science degrees should actually be an expert in philosophy and morality and other things. By the way, um, not so long ago, we were uh, quite convinced that if you were a software developer or you could do AI or machine learning, the future was yours. And we have already seen examples of even GPT-4 creating amazing code, doing the job of software developers. And even the one I've seen last week was somebody sketching in a napkin, a drawing of the website they wanted, uploading it into GPT-4, and then have it create all the code necessary to actually create that website. So, you know, it's automating very, highly intellectual and complex tasks, but usually within one domain of competence. And also it's good at algorithmic IQ-like tasks, which again, frees up or opens the door for humans to cultivate skills or competencies or qualities that are part of EQ rather than IQ. We won't compete when it comes to IQ, fact, retrieval, algorithmic, problem solving, et cetera. If there is a single correct answer, AI will find it faster and better than we can. But if it's about managing ourselves or managing other people, that's when we need to rely on human and humane skills. Yeah, I think these are all very complex questions. And um, I think uh, your um, talk also triggered some self-reflection here in the audience. But I, I, I also include... by, by some by some humans or by some by some humans. By no, some we don't have any bots. Okay. I don't have all right. I don't think okay. we have any bots here in the audience. Um, okay. You know, so Thank but you. we don't want to be discriminating, Anna. If they wanted to come, we would accept them, right? We absolutely. want to be inclusive. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We will have those bots um, here. But um, anyway, to repeat what you already said, the book is absolutely incredible. There are lots of amazing insights. Exactly. I, human. And I think overall, at least my impression uh, on the first read is that it's it's positive. It's really positive. It's not. It's really starting out by exposing what um, you know, what the frailties of the situation is, and what makes us human, but then takes us to the to a better place. Because, as you said, uh, technology is going to be shaping who we are in a different way, and we need to get to a better place as humans. Uh, as AI will definitely be a lot more efficient and uh, uh, helpful to us. So, thank you so much. Uh, for your time. Uh, look forward to seeing you back here in New York at some point. And also thank you to everyone who stayed on. We had about 80 people, I think, here in the room. And we will be also sharing this recording with, the, um, with all the participants. Um, our next session is going to be on April, on March 30th. Um, so, um, no, um, yes, on March 30th, I think March 20, uh, yeah, we have a book launch for the NYU folks. Uh, but those of you who are just coming for rethinking, um, rethinking work series, uh, we'll see you on April 12th, actually. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent presentation. And thank you, Anna. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you. Bye-bye to all.
thank you.